Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 756th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Leonie Geyer and Dory Bowen. We're thrilled to welcome poet Leah Niebauer here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Leonie Geyer makes paintings, drawings, site-based work, and books. Her work is characterized by idiosyncratic shapes that are deployed in a variety of spaces. Geyer's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and her work is held in numerous public collections. She was born in New York and currently lives and works in San Francisco. And our host today, Dr. Dory Bowen, writes on modern and contemporary art, focusing on perceptual practices that probe the texture of ordinary life. Her writing is published in Art in America, After Image, Culture and Musée, among others. She's currently completing a monograph on the diorama from the 19th century to contemporary installation art. She's, research she's a research professor in the Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University, and we're lucky to have her as an editor-at-large at the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Dory. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Very excited to talk to Leonie. Um, just to introduce Leonie, as Chloe said, she was born and raised in New York, and among her artistic influences were visiting the Met and her father's abstract painting. Um, she's been a real key figure in the Bay Area art scene, and um, her work, as we'll see, is very rich and very spare and um, has attachments to both history and the future. She's collaborated on book projects, and we're going to start with the first image, um, which is a collaboration that Leonie did with poet Bill Berkson. And we also thought it would be an apt beginning because we met through Bill's partner, wife, and comrade, Connie Llewellyn. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this piece, Leonie? Yeah, first I want to say I'm so honored to be here and um, thank you to Chloe and Fong and the rail and Dory um, and hi everyone. It's great to see so many uh, friends and wonderful people. Uh, Bill, yeah, Bill has been a key uh, person in my life and in this uh, collaboration, there was this, this is a one line poem all, all, everything, and one variations on a theme. And I, I just think that's, that speaks to our lives, to the, to the artist's life, and, you know, many people's lives that uh, are dedicated to, to a pursuit of meaning. Also, we had mentioned that it's interesting that Bill, a poet, was someone that struggled with words and how to apply words to images, not struggled in a failing way, but in a productive way. And Connie, also a longtime curator at the Berkeley Art Museum, how to wrangle with words so that they can in engage with uh, images alongside them, not uh, overtaking them. So both writers who thought about that, and you told me once that Bill had said that it's important to protect the mystery. What did that mean? You know, I, I don't know when Bill said that, but it's become like a mantra for me. I think that Bill was talking about the relationship between language and the visual, and that he was never seeking to um, explain the visual, but rather to create an experience in, in language that would um, sort of uh, 
occupy a space alongside the visual and be in a conversation. And when we made this book together, we thought about the the text and the and the drawings and the white space, the negative space of the book as these parallel streams. And um, yeah, I think that it's just so profound to me, the idea of protecting the mystery, because I think that is what art is at its core. Um, and all the, all the important things in life, love, <laughs> death, you know, all mysteries. Great, thank you. Well, we're here on the very happy occasion, Leonie, of your solo show at the Petra Bibo Gallery in New York, uh, where you have a rotating set of artworks, um, yet the marble piece, which we see here on the left, is a constant, which you call like a North Star, while the other works are swapped out amongst, I believe, 13 drawings you sent to the gallery, with its one remaining in the back. Can you talk a little bit about how you thought about this exhibition, the rotation and the images you placed there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when Petra invited me to uh, make an exhibition in her uh, beautiful space, I had not ever been there. And she sent me the floor plan and the dimensions. And it's a, it's a small uh, gem of a space. And I thought about what what did I want to do in that space? And even though the um, the dimensions of many of my works are small, uh, very small, sometimes uh, the sense of scale, you know, scale is is different than dimensions, and they seem to even the smallest uh, work on paper seems to need a lot of space. And so I thought, well, I really only wanted to install one work for each wall, but then I wouldn't be able to show very many works. So I had this idea that I proposed to Petra, what if I sent you, you know, X number of drawings and we had one marble piece on one wall and then we rotated. Uh, so there are three drawings on the, you know, one, two, on each of the other three walls and uh, one in the in the back little back room and um, she said yeah let's do it so we did so that way every couple of weeks you know you have a different iteration of the exhibition I see and I, I believe the next image is of right the marble piece which We'll get into your marble pieces, but uh, why do you think of this one as like the North Star around which the rotation happens? Um, is that my arrow? There's an arrow there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just, because there's only one painting in the exhibition, um, I thought that one should be the constant, easier to switch out works on paper. And besides this, you know, has a, a, just a different relationship, uh, painting and marble to, to uh, physical presence. And so the relationship to time is also, uh, should be, I think, should reflect that. Yeah, right, the solidity, this longevity. Um, so let's talk about your works on paper. Um, because you work with paper in a really interesting way and um, you work with it very in, oops, intentionally, a uh, two-ply Indian paper you've talked to me about. Um, you've described paint, uh, the paper making techniques that you're interested in. Um, so this seems like a good one to pause on and discuss because you can see there the little wood piece of wood in the paper. So it's clear that you're thinking about the image in relationship to that. Yeah, it's a little, uh, you know, a little piece of paper that somehow survived uh, two or 300 years and made its way to my drawing table where I tried not to wreck it. And it, it had uh, this little tiny little stick embedded in the paper, which I think, you know, somehow got 
stuck in there on the day the paper was made. And they're just, I'm, I'm very um, attentive to all the sort of the, the phenomenology of the, of the, uh, the field, the visual field, and then the, the physical uh, character of the paper. And so I'm responding to that when I make a drawing. And um, you, it's really hard to see in the screen. It's pretty hard to see in real life, but there actually are uh, two colors. There's a, a blue and then a graphite uh, line that's, that's, uh, that sits on top of the blue line. And I think a little vibration happens between these two, uh, two different kinds of pencils. I hope that that happens. And, you know, for me, it's really about um, energizing the whole uh, surface and space of the, of the substrate, whether it's a little piece of paper or a 30 foot wall or whatever it is that I'm working on. And this paper in particular, is there a story that goes with it? Yeah, there, you know, there was a, used to be a beautiful little uh, shop in North Beach in San Francisco um, owned by a fellow named Bill Haskell. And he was, he mostly had 19th century French uh, antiques and uh, other stuff. You'd go in and at first you'd think that you were in maybe a junk shop. And then you realized it was the most magical shop you'd ever been in. And uh, Bill would look for paper for me, paper that, uh, well, you know, he'd have stacks of paper that um, might have writing on it or printed matter, uh, 19th century botanical drawings and, and things like that. But I was really interested in finding paper that didn't have anything on it, but that was old. And of course that's not um, easy to find, but he, he did find a lot of paper for me. And you had other sources as well, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, but they're all disappearing. They're all uh, disappearing, yeah. yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to also talk about, well, obviously you're working with the paper here. So there's, you've got this crease, you're thinking about the color. Are there other aspects of the paper that you're responding to? Well, you know, the, uh, well, Connie curated a show years ago, a retrospective of the um, brilliant artist Paul Koss, and the title of that show was Everything Matters, just about, you know, one of the best exhibition titles ever. And it's, it's, it's like that, everything matters. So the character of the surface, the edges, the thickness, the thinness, the warmth, the coolness, uh, with old paper, um, Oftentimes, if there are little um, tears or stains or things like that, I have to decide, do I embrace that? Or is it a distraction? If it's a distraction, do I, do I trim it away? Or, you know, what, what do I do, right? So um, in this case, this paper isn't actually old paper, but it is made in the oldest paper making tradition of India. It's a little scrap of larger sheets that I tend to use the larger sheets, um, but then I keep all the little pieces too. I see. And uh, Landy, you've told me that um, sometimes there are little things in the paper like hair or um, I don't know, something that might connect you to someone else or some other place. Do you, you actually like sit down and you work with the paper and you come up with a form or do you go looking for the paper? um with that in mind like I want to put this form on a certain paper well I I think I'm I'm always on the lookout for paper that um I think I can work on and it has to do with just it's it's specific character it doesn't matter uh you know where it was made or who made it or if it you know could be costly or or very inexpensive paper handmade or machine made it doesn't really matter it just matters you know does it does it call to me and papers are so certainly handmade papers you know they're all unique they're things that are made by individual human beings and you you feel that in them um 
and and sometimes in the case of that uh, the Indian paper, I've even seen the handprints of the paper maker uh, or his assistant um, on a few sheets, and you know I really enjoyed that. That's so interesting. So it's not really like a background. It becomes, and this is a great example where it becomes part of the piece. Can you yeah. explain where this is coming from? Yeah, I don't think of the paper as a background. I think of it as a ground in the sense of like, uh, I don't know, the ground of being or something. Uh, I think of it as a field, you know, a visual field, an energy field, um, a space, a surface, and an object. Uh, this is just a little scrap of tracing paper, and this is a page from a book I made last year um, with the really incredible um, artist publishers, Land and Sea, Oakland. And I have this archive. I didn't set out to make an archive, but over, you know, 30 years of more than the, more than 30 years of working in my studio, uh, it's sort of it's sort of. Um, became an archive, all these little pieces of paper that, um, uh, well, actually when it began was when I was going to do a, a site-based project and I was doing that in Germany and I had, I don't think I'd been out of the country before. And so I was a little nervous about going, particularly to Germany. So I, I wanted to take some things with me uh, as reference for these um, wall drawings I was going to make. And at that point, I think it was in the nineties, the technology was that you know we still had slides and you would scan the slide and get a, a, a printout like of Xerox. So it would be, so I was kind of cropping out just the central shape from uh, slides of paintings. And then I had Xeroxes and traces of slides of paintings. So there was all these, there were these um, steps of uh, mediation. And then I, put these little scraps into a folder and got on a plane and went and did this um, exhibition. And when I came back, I, I, I thought, oh, I'll keep these Xeroxes in a folder. And then gradually, uh, uh, as I work from studio to site-based work back and forth and have uh, various um, drawings and, and, and tracings and photocopies and tracings of photocopies and all of that, that's become the archive, which exists in a couple of archival boxes and a few folders. And this was the material uh, that we decided to um, make a book from. Great. Um, just a little bit about your process. I'm, I'm sure people are interested. You make your, you told me you make your own pigment with linseed oil. Um, and you told me that you think of yourself as a colorist working with only a few pigments, not the modern version like cadmium red, but like it could be an ancient color. And here we have some touchstones on the screen. These are objects that Leonie returns to as inspiration that relate to your interest in sort of, you know, primary and ancient. Can, and you speak about how you engage with the prehistoric and the ancient as part of your work. Yeah, well, you know, we could start with the color red. It's, um, I've, I've thought about red particularly um, for a very long time because it's sort of the first and last color. Uh, you know, the first in the sense that um, in the cave drawings or paintings, you know, you see black from the charcoal and then you see red. And then when we think about the traces that are left thousands of years later, like in the, the Greek uh, sculptures that we now know are polychromed, uh, but when 99% of the color has uh, eroded away, sometimes you do still see a trace of red. Um, so that's really powerful to me. And I'm interested in, I mean, I use cadmium red once in a while, but you know, I, I, I do really love these colors that are like the iron oxides and the yellow ochres and the mineral blues. And I, I tend to use those more. Uh, so great, thank you. Um, so we paused on this image that Leonie chose, a Tantra painting, also a touchstone 
Um, and these paintings have a limited number of motifs that repeat over and over. They're not intended as art, but as a tool for meditation. Um, so do you think of your work as tantric? Do, is there a place that you're trying to arrive at in your discovery, or is it a different process closer to what you know, people would use a tantric painting for? Well, I would never, I mean, it, your work is tantric if you're a tantrika, a tantric practitioner. So I, I would never say that. And then, uh, but I, I do feel an affinity with uh, tantric painting, of course, and I'm inspired by them. Um, and as you said, you know, they were not, they're not created to be artworks. They're, they are meant to function as a tool for meditation. And you know, I I think my drawings and paintings. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that it it, um, it offers anything. Uh, you know, any kind of formal construct uh, like a meditation. You know, that's a practice. But but I I do hope that they invite people to just maybe slow down um, a little bit if they if they feel like that and, and, you know, enter in and look closely, you know, it, it's not the kind of work that if you just look at it for 10 seconds, you know, it's not going to be very rewarding. It, it really um, asks that you spend a little time with it. And, and I think that my work, uh, you know, it unfolds over time. It takes, it takes time to make, but it also takes time to see. Your work's been described as both repetitive and singular by a number of writers, which is kind of a paradox. Uh, this And this relates to the tantric paintings, this repetition, and yet each one is different. Uh, poet Lisa Rahe wrote that and this is one of our, our touchstones, you and I, as Henri Faucillon argues, forms are pre-existing, not only in the mind, but in the world. And this goes a long way to explaining the uncanny familiarity of Dyer's singular forms. So the uncanny familiarity, and then Mac McGinnis also writes of your artwork this way, um, he calls them reincarnations, which is a term he got from you to describe your work can you explain a little bit this idea about how these forms emerge? And, you know, we could talk about Faucillon a bit, this idea of form. It's not the normal Western way of thinking of form, but they kind of pass through time and through your practice, they reemerge, but differently. Yeah, thank you. That's a big question, Dory. I, I would say that, um, you know, as an art student, uh, I kind of tried a lot of different things, you know, as art students do. And I, uh, you mentioned my father who was an abstract painter for the most part, abstraction. Uh, but when I was really little, he was making abstract paintings, New York school paintings. And those were the first paintings I ever saw. It was the first artist I knew. And in a way, abstraction, it's my first language. I mean, I, I feel I didn't come to it from representation. You know, it's just like, I just felt like I always kind of swam in that, in that, in those, that ocean. And um, oh, what was I going to say about form? I mean, I think what, what um, at a certain point after trying and abandoning various ways of working, I realized that what I wanted to do was just make something that that came alive. And I made these shapes and I did recognize immediately, this is like 30 plus years ago, when I made these kind of weird little shapes uh, one day that they were, both familiar and mysterious to me. I just, I just recognized something. Uh, oh yeah, this is, you know, this feels like mine. And then that was the trajectory. 
Um, I, I did make up a rule, you know, artists tend to make up rules like the parameters of our inquiry. And I had a rule for the, about 15 years or so that I would never repeat a shape. And the reason for that was that I wanted to feel um, each time, you know, I was, was about to make a mark that it was like the batter coming up to the bat or something that you wanted to feel just fully present and respond to what was happening in that moment. And then one day I was sitting in my studio staring at the wall or something and I thought, well, why, why not repeat a shape? It's, it's a different moment. And, um, you know, you can't step twice in the same river as Heraclitus said, it's a different, uh, context, it's a different uh, energy. And so that then became kind of a new trajectory, which was to, to dig into the archive, look at my the works I had made, and in e with each shape, um, kind of reconsider it. Like, does this merit uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, reincarnation, for lack of a better word, uh, or, or reiteration. And, and almost always, or always with that decision to try to work um, anew with that shape, the shape changes. Uh, sometimes the changes are really subtle, just as if you try to make it the same, but um, you can't because it's a different moment. You're gonna have a subtle variation and other times they, they change radically, so. Great. That's so beautiful. Well put. Your work, um, this I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Your work doesn't engage directly, directly with race, sex, gender, issues of I identity that are so um, important now in the discourse. You were, however, recently included in the September 2022 issue of Public, uh, a journal that was um, titled Devotion and described as, quote, a beautifully designed radical collection of overlooked and forgotten IBPOC and LGBTQ2S plus archives. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, being included in this volume? Do you think it helps get at what, I don't know, I think of as kind of the queer aspect of your forms, which are sometimes weird, sometimes scary, and sometimes really funny? Well, I was, um thrilled to be included in this it's a really a beautiful uh issue it's 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 a book and uh my work has rarely been uh considered in the discourse of um you know uh gender or queer uh, uh identity but here i am i mean you know i often feel like there used to be uh, that t-shirt, it said, nobody knows I'm a lesbian. And, you know, it's kind of how I sometimes feel, although uh, when asked um, directly, how to, you know, does gender or queerness or other aspects of your identity, um, you know, how, how does that inform your work? It's very difficult to answer that question because I am uh, committed to abstraction. I do consider abstraction to be a space of freedom. Uh, certainly when we look at the history of abstraction, which began with the cave paintings, uh, many of those paintings were made by women. We now know the cave scientists have you know, figured this out. Um, and many of the tantric paintings were made by women more often than than men in the communities. They are made by uh, women more than 50% of the time, which not everybody knows. Um, so I wonder if there's a particular history about women and abstraction. And then of course, we have the incredible history of um, uh, black abstract painters and sculptors and queer artists. And I mean, I don't know how to answer that question except to say that uh, inhabiting a female body, a queer body, um, moving through the world. I'm also a Jew. I don't know where that comes into it, but I watched Mark Marin last night. And so I just 
tossing that out there. Uh, you know, that's part of my identity, uh, being a New Yorker and now a New Yorker in exile and um, sort of a, a hybrid of a New York and, and Northern California person. Everything that we experience comes into play, uh, but, you know, for me, I think it just has to do with maybe how does the work embody my values? And certainly my values relate to, uh, uh, you know, being a feminist and, you know, a radical person. So, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. Well, I think you did. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, if we could move um, to the next few images. We're, oh, this one, I find this is what I was thinking of when I was saying your queer forms, because for some reason, I mean, it is very, you know, kind of uh, symmetric. There's a symmetry and there is a reference to design and patterning, but I find it very funny too. Um, and I don't know if you think of it that way. I'm really happy that you um, that you think it's funny because I think it's kind of funny. I think it's kind of sexy. I think it's kind of um, I don't know. It's a little poignant to me because there's a, a, a you know a precarity to it. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. Like precarious. Um, and sometimes I make shapes that I think are kind of scary. And I, I love that. I mean, I love that art can be, uh, you know, have both humor and uh, gravitas. And of course, one of my art heroes is Gustin, who, who, you know, everything that he made, I think, was um, uh, channeling the tragicomic, right? So, yeah. I forget what the question was, Dory. Oh, it's just a response to this piece that my response, mm -hmm. that I always find this one in particular, very funny, sort of this one foot sort of tail like, you know, flapping. Um, and I was just curious if that's something that you think about in terms yeah. of your, but yes, you do. Well, I, I think it has to do with, you know, trying to make a form that comes alive and, you know, in life, there's there's humor, there's terror, there's longing, right? There's all, all of those things. A vessel with arms, I like that. Uh, and we'll get to vessels, uh, but let's talk about Forrest Bess, one of your touchstones, um, and one of the many artists who um, has visions and that you reference and that you're inscribed by um, these inscrutable paintings are incredible. Uh, you've also talked about shaker gift drawings and we'll show those. Do visions inspire your work? Well, yes, uh, in a way. I mean, I think that, that we know that Forrest Bess would go to sleep at night and he would see the painting uh, absolutely clearly, you know, with his eyes closed and then he would, make a little drawing and then the next day he would make the painting. And uh, that doesn't happen for me very often, but sometimes I have, I, I have glimmers, you know, could be like a fragment of a shape or, or just uh, something that, um, you know, a, a, an angle, a curve, something, a little bit of contraction or expansion, a twist or something that, that I see in a fleeting way that impels me to, uh, you know, get out of bed and make, go make a little drawing so that I can work on it the next day. Yeah, I think that happens. But not as, you know, not every day. <laughs> not every day, but there are ways in which that happens. Yeah, and I don't wait for that to happen. You know, really, uh, most of the of the work happens just in the process. So, I, I just start, I just start working, you know, I, I pick up a pencil or I, mi I mix up some paint and uh, often uh, takes a while for the shape or shapes to emerge from the process. 
Great. So we have a few more of the marble pieces and then um, a view of an installation that you did called Form in the Realm of at CCA, the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts. Um, that was in 2018. And for this piece, you did, I believe, two wall drawings. Is that correct, Leonie? There were five. Five. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain those? Yeah. Just so there were, um, uh, so this was a, a, a big exhibition of drawings and paintings. Uh, there were paintings on marble and there were some paintings on panels. You could see on the little black square, there is a painting on a panel and on the back wall. Um, Dory, could you move the, the, the arrow oh, for a sec? Yeah, not and then, going. oh, okay. So then you can't see it in this, um, uh, installation view, but on the wall, the back wall that has that beautiful um, uh, curve, I made a wall drawing way up high, very high, almost, you know, I don't know, 15 or 18 feet off the ground. And then to the right, there were two more shapes. And then in the, the second gallery, the exhibition extended into from the main gallery into a, a um, another gallery that was a, just a little bit smaller, there were two more wall drawings. And, and the wall drawings really hovered on the edge of visibility. Uh, in the, the, the wall drawings in the uh, first gallery, there was red, yellow, and blue. Some people came in and immediately saw uh, the yellow one. You know, some people missed them entirely. Um, I wasn't trying to... Uh, make something that was difficult to see. It's just, I do feel, um, I'm very, I'm very intrigued with that, with that, um, that space right at the edge of the visible. Sometimes I have to make something that resides there. Right. Right. Um, and then you had touchstones, what you call your touchstones uh, in works that inspire you in this space as well. Um, I believe the next image is of two Shaker gift drawings. Um, and these were in a vitrine. Is that correct? Well, the one on the left was we were so lucky to be able to borrow, uh, I think, three very small Shaker gift drawings from the Shaker Museum. In, um, in New York, uh, I had done a project there, which we're gonna see in a minute, I think a few images. And um, so these drawings were also made mostly by women and, and young women and even girls. And they did come to them in dreams um, as visions, as messages. And uh, when, um, my curator, Anthony Huberman, and I were talking about this exhibition that we were uh, developing together. We had many uh, really incredible uh, conversations, long conversations in my studio. And he, he understood how um, certain works were really, you know, do function as touchstones for me or obsessions you know i keep coming back to them and 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 studying contemplating thinking about them and so he asked could we uh maybe include a few of these things in the exhibition and so we did and and on the left uh that little card it's it actually is the sort of the calling card of mother anne and she was the the um spiritual leader of the Shakers. And you had other touchstones as well, such as Terry Fox's The Children's Tapes. Yes. And two jars, what are called, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna say this correctly, Ungutarium or Tear Vessels. Um, yeah. And here you also wanted to reference um, this Fred Sandback installation. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in uh, the show. No, no, it wasn't. Um, and we don't have an image here of Terry Fox. Uh, his The one video he made, which is called The Children's Tape. So 
I encourage people to look it up. It's a great work. Uh, and I we had a little uh, in the in the second gallery. I wish I didn't think to include this image. Um, but I think you can see it on the on my website or the Wattis website. There's an image of uh, a ledge, and there's a TV, like a TV from the 70s, with the video, which I think was made in 19, around 1970, um, of the children's tapes, and then a marble piece, you know, with a lot of negative space in between them. Um, and the children's tapes involved everyday objects like a spoon, a glass of water, a candle uh, and matches. And he just did these little actions for his child. Uh, and I thought that that was so, uh, it's just a really um, profound magical piece that I felt an affinity with. Uh, how in the everyday, in the, in the ubiquitous and humble, um, matter of life you know you have these moments that of uh that are that are magic just moments of awareness of course the shakers that they were dedicated to that that was they talked about um the gift and that's the title of this um installation that i made uh in 2006 thanks for the date so uh the 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 idea of the gift is that it is available to us at any moment. It could be like when you take a sip of water, uh, or you, um, you know, pet your kitty cat, or you you find the just the right word. You know, it could be anything. Um, so this was a really very uh, 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 a peak life experience for me to be able to work in this building, the Brethren's Workshop, which is one of the oldest Shaker buildings that um, exists. And the Fred Sandback, we put that in there because when I went to the Brethren's Workshop to do this project, um, it was a residency. I was there for about a month, maybe five weeks. I hardly saw or spoke to anyone the entire time. It was the most uh, profound solitude I have experienced in my life. And I didn't want to bring a lot uh, with me. Um, I've just brought three books and my materials, but I certainly brought Fred Sandback uh, in my mind along with the Shakers. And I thought also, uh, I was thinking a lot about Richard Tuttle's wire drawings while I was uh, making this work. Um, I just want to mention in this on this wall, so there's a painting all the way to the left. You can hardly see it. And there's a painting on the window, which we're going to see a close up in a moment. But notice uh, above the strip of wood, which is where the shakers would, you know, they'd have tables and chairs, but then they would put the chairs up to clear the space so that they could dance when they had their ecstatic, uh, you know, when they were shaking, right? Um, that's what that strip of wood is. It used to have pegs in it. Um, but above that is a sequence of numbers. And I got up on a ladder and I really studied them because from the ground, I couldn't really tell why um, they go from two to eight. And so I got up there and I really tried to see had there been a zero, a one, a nine, a zero on the other end, no, it was just two through eight. And they were painted in this beautiful 19th century hand. So that's a mystery. Why is there only, you know, two through eight? Why were they painted up so high up by the ceiling? We actually don't know what that room was used for. Um, in the Brethren's Workshop, they had various rooms that were dedicated to uh, their commercial industries, like making furniture, and they were they were the first people in the United States to um, uh, develop a business of uh, seeds, you know, selling selling seeds for gardening. And they had a school. Uh, there was a room for the for the children. And so we thought, um, you know, the director of research at the Shaker Museum and I talked about this. We thought perhaps this was the schoolroom, but then why would they put those numbers up high for the little tiny tots? How are they gonna see them? So as Bill said, protect the mystery, right? 
This was the painting on the window. This uh, installation is still there at the Shaker Museum. If anybody wants to visit, I, I don't know. The window painting has probably faded by now, but I think everything else is in good condition. Um, I haven't been back, but I hope to. Maybe this, this summer I'll get to go back. It's a really special place. So with the window pieces, oh, Dory, did you wanna? No, no, go ahead, Larry. I was just gonna say with the window, paintings, um, you know, I think of the view of the world outside the window as the ground of the painting, which is changing moment by moment. You know, the clouds are moving and the light is changing. I do think of them a little bit in relationship to, to film, you know, to something time-based. Um, and I also feel like in a way they, they are where I take painting, and I, I take it as far as I can into uh, maybe a conceptual uh, uh, realm. And I do like to make these, but they're not easy to make and I've only made a few of them. So taking your forms out into the, into the world, um, the last image that we have, oops, it's not there is from your Delaplane residency in the mission in 2022. Um, Chloe, is it possible to get that image? It's a, it's video. a little video. Yeah, uh, there it is. <laughs> uh, if you could loop it. Um, so can you tell us about this piece, Leonie? Yeah, um, there was a, a really uh, wonderful gallery in the mission a few blocks from where I live and I have my studio in my apartment and these two uh, young curator young gallerists um, uh, uh, Sophia Pell and Cole Solinger they had this gallery which years before that had been the Kiki gallery which was uh, uh, in the 80s showing queer artists and and you know all kinds of uh, incredible work. Uh, Rick Jacobson uh, was the director of the Kiki Gallery in the 80s. And they had um, this, this uh, pole on the side of the building. And so when they began their gallery, they thought, well, what can we do with that pole? Maybe we should have a flag residency. And so I was one of you know numerous artists who um, made a flag <laughs> with a pole. And I, when they asked me if I want to do that, of course, I never thought about making a flag before, but I, I try to say yes when if somebody asks me to do something, if it feels like I might, you know, learn something or in the process. And so I made the flag, silk flag. It's kind of an apt way to show your work. I mean, given that we're talking about the life of forms and how they move out into the world, they repeat and yet, they are singular. This is just such a great way and following on the glass piece at the Shaker Museum, it seems, I wonder if there are other ways of showing your work that you've thought about, you've had collaborations, books, worked with poets, and we haven't even mentioned all of them. Um, are these things that you wanna continue doing and you also at the same time continue your studio practice, which, is very, um, you know, concentrated. Yeah, you know, that's the thing about saying yes to something. Uh, it always opens up new possibilities for further further uh, investigation, right? So I didn't know if I was, I mean, I don't know how to sew. <laughs> you should see the back of the applique. It looks kind of like a, 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 a battleground. Actually, I think I might even prefer the verso to the, to the front. I was worried. I didn't know because my work often, you know, you need to come up very close to even see it. So I was worried, how could it work if you're standing on the ground and it's 12 or 15 feet high? Are you going to... Um, is it going to function? Are you going to get anything from the experience? But somehow, uh, I think you you did, you do. And um, I'm trying to make some drawings on silk now. I had some little scraps 
uh, this piece of white silk, the main part of it was a piece. Um, so, so, so when I was asked to make a flag, I thought, what am I going to make a flag out of? And I remembered that I had a piece of silk, white silk. I don't know why I bought it like 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know what I thought I was going to do with it. It was folded up in a brown paper bag somewhere in the corner of my studio. And I was like, could I find it? And then it took me 10 minutes and I found it. Um, and so now I have these little scraps left over and I'm I've been trying to make pencil drawings on them. Uh, I was very inspired by some, some scraps of, uh, you know, linen that was many thousands of years old in the Egyptian um, uh, galleries at the Met uh, the last time I was in New York. And I, so I've been thinking about working on, on scraps of silk or linen. I don't know, we'll see. And uh, I, I have a, a, a collaboration with, with a, a wonderful poet that's kind of in the early days that I'm working on. Dory asked about that. I, I love to uh, collaborate, but it's, it's not something that I, I seek. It's just when it happens, um, it's like a dream. Leonie, just to loop back to the beginning, your work, I think what I've learned from your work is that in order to preserve that mystery that Bill Berkson referenced, one has to observe carefully. And I, one thing I've learned from your work is how I don't observe carefully because I did not see the wall paintings at CCA. <laughs> um, and I became aware of that there's so much more. Um, and in a way- I know, Dory, but your daughter did. She did, I know, and that's what she I learned. Was like eight years old, I think, at the time. Okay, all right, let's not go there. She sees <laughs> it, I'm trained to, and I don't see it. So it, it does open up, like that's the mystery, right? There's so much more there than um, we can see, and your work is so carefully rendered to make us aware. Is that how you think of your work, or is that just me sort of how my, I come to it? Is it instructional in a way for the viewer? Well, I think, you know, I mean, there were days when I walked into the waters and I didn't even see my own drawing. You know, I, I think really it's about paying attention. I mean, to me, that's kind of my job as an artist is to pay attention. And then in the work, you know, sort of offer up an experience in which someone else, if they, you know, choose to enter in, practice paying attention and see what, what they can see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonie and Dory, for that incredible conversation and all of your generous responses. That was really, really special. Thank you. Um, we are moving into the Q&A, and there have been several amazing questions asked uh, throughout the conversation. We're going to start with Kat in the audience. Um, Kat, I am going to give you the chance to unmute and ask your question directly. And if anyone else has a question, please feel free to post it in the chat or raise your hand. Hi there. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks so much for um, showing us, letting us see this, this wonderful work and hearing your thoughts about it. Um, and this is not actually my question, but I, I ha have to say that um, just off of what you were just saying, the the, the wor your work seem is so friendly in the way that it invites a person to pay attention, but not like overwhelming, you know. So it's this really kind of lovely, um, like delicate invitation that it makes. That um, that anyway seems very special to me. But actually, my question was about the marble pieces. Um, I was wondering um, how you make those. So it's oil on incised marble. Um, I don't know what that would actually look like making that. And I'm wondering if the process feels radically different from, from the drawing, where the, the drawing um, seemed like you sort of you, you sort of see what happens. I, I just wondered if, yeah, if you could say more about the marble pieces. 
Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, thank you for saying that the work is friendly. No one's ever said that before, and I really love that. Um, I I do think it's kind. I have this kind of it's like a borscht belt line. If people know about the borscht belt, it's I do think that you know my work is for anyone, but you know maybe not for everyone. But anyway, that I really appreciate that. Um, with the marble pieces, you know, I get these these. They're they're the cast offs. They're the remnants from uh, my marble guy. When they when they do jobs for fancy people, they have these little pieces uh, laying around in the marble yard. And so, you know, the work begins when I go to the marble yard and I see what I, maybe I can find there. Um, and then uh, I look at the pieces. It's not really different than looking at a piece of paper or a wall or uh, a gessoed panel in the sense that um, I'm responding to its, its uh, specific character. And then, you know, I make a drawing uh, on a scrap of paper and I use this uh, technique I learned in kindergarten, I think everybody did, where you uh, make a drawing and then you kind of take a, a you know, a, a, I take a colored pencil or something and scribble on the back and then I transfer it draw it again, uh, but I, I try not to press down too hard so that I don't really get that, that great a drawing. It's more just like, it's kind of imperfect and it, it, it's just more like uh, barely there, like a guide. And then I, I, sometimes I guess I draw it again a little bit and then I take this really funky chisel that I have. I, kind of think of it as the world's saddest chisel for some reason, uh, probably, you know, might have belonged to my father, I don't know. And then I, I incise the line and I really have to do that. I have to kind of scratch in a little bit. It turns out that marble is kind of soft. Uh, it's, it's kind of like skin, it's porous. And, but there's just something um, I have, referred to it as it's a kind of atavistic pleasure where you, you know, incise the marble, uh, but it's also a moment of transformation uh, that happens with that, you know, I guess, disrupting the surface. And it's, I'm always a little scared to do it because the marble's so beautiful and I think, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, um, screw it up or something. But, um, and then I paint. And then sometimes I wipe the paint away. And then sometimes I try to sand it out, but you can't ever really sand it out because, uh, because the marble is porous, it immediately absorbs some of the oil. And so sometimes that's all that's left is like, you know, within the shape, I leave a stain of oil, but sometimes there's color and sometimes not. And I've just painted the edge. And I did want to talk about edges a little bit. They're really, really important to me. They're, they're boundaries, you know, between uh, the interior and the exterior, uh, between the shape and the surrounding space. Uh, you could even think of them as being, as kind of um, articulating the edge between the visible and the invisible. And there's this beautiful, um, uh, idea from Myron Stout, who is also a painter uh, that I'm obsessed with, a touchstone. And Myron Stout wrote something, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it. He probably said it more elegantly, but he said an edge, the edge reveals what is contained within the shape. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So yeah, <laughs> that's my answer. I hope that that answers your question. Wow, that was an amazing answer, Lani. And thank you so much for that question, Kat. That was such a generative question. Um, the next question is going to be from GE. Uh, GE, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you so very much. And thank you so much for taking some time to, to share with us today. My question is, is your art, your expression within your artistic approach about liberation from our sort of compulsions to and about language? That's a beautiful question. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, 
I love language, especially poetry, but I read, you know, I read novels, I read uh, a lot about art, and um, I, I, I love language. Uh, and um, literature, which is really important to me. It's really, I'm, I'm on book four of, of Proust now, volume four, and it is one of my goals in life to finish it before I kick the bucket. That being said, as much as I love language, it's not my medium. I have done a little bit of writing, but I'm not a writer. And I'm really interested in, I mean, I'm a visual thinker. I just was born that way. I, I, I was born with a hungry eye. I can never get enough of uh, art and, and just the visual world. Um, uh, the world outside my window, the the light and shadow in the corner of the room. And I, I'm really interested in how the visual is its own language and that that there there are experiences that we have that are beyond words or they, they, they slip in between the words. Uh, and that's, you know, that's my territory. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for that question, GE. Um, the, next, the next and last question is going to be from Barbara. Barbara, you should be able to unmute. Thank you. Wow, what an honor. Last question. Um, hi, Lainey. <laughs> this has been such a delight just hearing you talk about your work so eloquently. Um, I was wondering if you talk if you could talk a little bit more about time in the work, because for me, there's such an expansive time in the work in each piece. And I was thinking about what you said about um wanting to make forms that are alive. And I was thinking about how the forms really feel like they're living and that they're, I was wondering if that's maybe why I kept thinking about that the pieces are all in this kind of eternal present. Mm -hmm. um, so oh. I wonder if there's more that you could say about how, how you think about time in the work. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. It's so, um, that's very rich. Um, it's incredible to see you. This is my one of my best friends from graduate school from 30 years ago that we've only recently reconnected. So um, time, right, is, is evident right there in our relationships with each other, in our relationship with, with, with ideas and, and images and art to me is time travel. I mean, when you look at the cave painting or the Egyptian wall painting or um, uh, uh, the Mondrian, the Morandi, uh, and you really look closely and you see the you you can you can you connect with that moment in which the mark was made, you know, and there it is evident in the the little bit of pigment or the you know uh, whatever, right? You 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 connect in that moment with the human being, whether it was just the other day or uh, you know ten thousand years ago, who made that mark, and they made that mark with a with a um, a desire, uh, a longing uh, for meaning, right? And so if the meaning's lost as they do get lost over time or change, right? This is what Faucillon talks about. He talks about how a form arises in a particular uh, context, a time and a place, and then moves through time and space and meanings are lost, but new meanings accrue, right? And that's what, that's the life of forms. That's why they are alive to us. When each of us uh, sees the form in the in the work of art, we see something differently, right? We're seeing it. We're bringing our all of our our frame of reference, our experiences to that moment, and so then the meaning of the work expands. 
Did that I answer was, the question? Yeah, that was really beautiful, Annie. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that question, Barbara. Wow. Thank, thank you, you all of you for your questions today. Um, and thank you again to Lainey and Dory for this incredible conversation at the rail. We have a tradition of ending our community events with the poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Leah Niebuhr, here to the stage. Leah Niebuhr grew up in Iowa. She's a poet, deep listener, interdisciplinary scholar, and current PhD candidate in English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver, whose work explores embodied strategies for livable futures. Her first book, Soft Apocalypse, was selected by Andrew Zawaki for the 2021 Georgia Poetry Prize, and her work has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail as well as other publications. Welcome, Leah. Thanks so much, Chloe, and thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for having me. That was such a delightful conversation to listen in on for the last hour or so. Um, Lanny, I love hearing how you're in conversation with your materials and all about these emergent forms and how you think about edges being at the heart of things. Um, that was just really lovely. Thanks. So I'm gonna be reading from Soft Apocalypse, my forthcoming book, which is in conversation with a bunch of intimate strangers, including Clarice Lispector, John Coltrane, Rilke and others. Um, but the lines that have been rattling around in my brain all week are actually from C.D. Wright uh, from her book, Deep Stuff Come Shining. And they go, there are enough signs of the lack of tenderness in the world. And yet, and yet, all you have to do is ask. And it goes on. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems that consciously or unconsciously I wrote at the crux of the signs of lack and that doubly insistent and yet. Dream of risked phrases in space. Failing spectacularly at orderliness, the primroses rush our yellowness, a soft geometry unfinishing the edges, the sentence giving into its most, we could say phosphenic. Sense, pressure, tiny implosions, even in suppose a vacant lot under terrible conditions, the blooms how they fall together and fall apart easily, making a damp room in my ear, the whir of the fan against the window against which in late June we lean, passing mute fireworks between us, clinical slingshots wheeling in the sky and heat lightning too, making brief incredible shapes, our hands not keeping time, keeping alternately the oscilloscope pressed to the roof of our mouths, their pink apprehensions unmaking us, making us so possible, I believe, are lingering here over and over, rubbing against somehow what cold and sugarless happens. I was gathering raw material. I was seeking an expanse. We were living yet at angles to ourselves, blinking on and off, reversing inside, painting the yellow lines, the factory floor, the road narrowing. I thought of the space between my legs, gradients, the fervid rooms, vectors, a rover powering down, the nearness of my mind to a bird climbing high and alone in the clear air. This is a test. The morning blares its lament over the shifting streets, foreclosures, busted up tennis courts I might have used in childhood to practice my crossover. A future came fast, faster through the intestines, heart, liver, cellular transfer, chemical tentacles in the water, a hiccup in the brain. At point zero, every element becomes a startling thing. A wreck becomes an opening, a slick young porpoise washes up to the sandy edge. One of the central press questions of this book um, appears in the February issue of the Brooklyn Rail uh, at the end of this really hard scrabble poem that ends, how do I get out of this production machine? Um, and one way to escape the production machine according to Jack Halberstam is to fail it. Uh, and in failing, find these alternate gestures and economies and sideways relationships and worlds that are not only emergent, but already manifest at the site of failure. 
So um, I'll end with two poems that offer kind of other economies and modes of being. This one, particularly in the spectacular space of queer failure and its subsequent worlding. We are the ones that swim, not diurnal, mechanical, a glass in the hand, honeysuckle, violet eons slipping the grasp. Love needs reality. The corner store goes out of business after all. The desert moves to the back of the retina, the throat, the glass crushed across the pink tile floor, the stair, the edge of the law catches us. Here's a tear in the dress, the surface, a break in the logic of it. We glitter softly out of it, half naked, making an entrance at the abyssal zone. Everyone applauded. Yes, everyone it appeared was having a great time. A big plush covered expression, a little swizzle around the waist, a place for stretching out in the middle of what we knew, an excess, a wobble, in each corner, the mismatched confessionals going over and over, the fringe material sliding up in the low lights. We turn at the point of entry, idling inside, the room's minor apprehensions skirting us, just glossing our shifting in lieu of hope, back and forth on the soles of the foot, then you, dear almost impossible. You made an appearance after all, a bright silver linking herself in time through us saying, you're the bottom of the ocean. I'm a fish in the sky. We eased ourselves into an open frequency, putting the fish back to water all night. God is not pretty. So familiar, sweat covered, half dressed and banging open a screen in the side of a yellow dirt encrusted trailer. What is it that you need? They said. I said, not a damn thing. I handed my hell through the window, not speaking, lips of sand whispering a change in the making for better or for worse. No telling what devils are behind and before us. They turn to stir a pot of beans, mutter something to a figure in the bed sheets, make you a little change. Nothing adds itself up in the break. I come away with cold coffee, a snake plant, anesthesia for the loving, and a stack of postcards from places I've never been. Chemical distortion hits the eye's horizon as the bright planets go up in smoke. Leah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for reading today. That was really, really brilliant. Thank you. Um, and thank you again to Dory. Thank you to Leonie. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation, who sponsor our NSC program and make daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our growing archive, which you can find on our YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like this NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for Sick Through to Furstenberg, a rail reading curated by Yuko Otomo and Basil King. And you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So nice. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a good one. Bye bye. Miss you, Dory. Thank you, Lenny. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dory. And go see the show. Oh yeah, go see the show. <laughs> Thank you, Dory. Everybody. Thank you, Dory. Thanks for the reading. Sorry. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Much love. Bye, everyone. Bye.